Okay, so uh, this is uh, how to write a research paper for a college level history course. Um, so this presentation is going to go over uh, not only the specific stuff you need to know for your, mid, uh, your fall research paper um, for this class, but also just general um, tips and, uh, and whatnot for writing, um, really for writing any kind of paper for a college history class because uh, it is very different from any uh, writing that you've done for previous history classes, if you've done any writing for previous history classes. Uh, and it's also uh, going to be uh, probably in, in some significant ways different from any writing you've done for even your college level English class. So uh, let's, let's just kind of go through the presentation. If at any point anyone has any questions, just call out and interrupt me because I might not be able to see you from over here at my desk. Um, all right, so uh, it's important to understand this is a, this paper we're gonna be doing is a introductory level paper. Uh, this is, uh, it is gonna have far lower requirements than you would normally expect to see for a research paper on a college level. Uh, but I say that, I mean, this is the level I would expect from my, you know, community college class at Lone Star College, which is, this is, right? Um, if you were to take a freshman level class at a university like Texas A&M or UT, um, you would probably not have a research paper till your sophomore year. Uh, that research paper would be a lot harder than this, but still, this is a freshman level course. For a freshman level course, you would probably just have a um, paper, a book analysis paper like you'll be doing next semester over if I die in a combat zone. But um, I thought, you know, uh, since I got rid of Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, I would move my little like kind of easy spring research paper to the fall instead. Um, so this is called History in the Movies, and I will go over that with you in a minute. But first, uh, let me just kind of talk about what you're going to do. So you're going to select a movie from a list of approved movies. Um, this assignment was just now added to Canvas. I'm still editing the assignment as current to make sure that all the links and stuff work in it. Um, and some of the dates, there may be some like you know, error, uh, typos and stuff in the dates. But really fast, let me show you um, what that assignment looks like. I'm gonna zoom that in. Okay, we see that pretty well. Okay, so um, this, I just uh, see right there, I've already got a mistake. It's thir It says 1302 and this is for 1301. Because normally um, this is, uh, this paper, I since uh, I used to do Uncle Tom's Cabin in the fall, uh, I did this paper usually due at the end of February instead, but I moved it. So, like I said, there may be some mistakes here. Um, I'm going to scroll down and show you the movies. So, you've got a list of movies here. These are just a list that I made. If you think of a movie that you would like to do instead of this list, you can see me individually about it. Don't, like, stop me in the middle of class or right now to ask about a specific movie. Um, you look over the list, and then if you come up with a different movie you'd like to do, just talk to me about it. I'll probably say yes. It depends on the movie, but most likely I'll say yes. So this list of movies, I picked a wide range of movies here so that um, you will uh, be able to find some movie that you'll be able to watch, whether you've got Netflix or Amazon Prime or Hulu or if, if you don't have any of those things, a couple of these movies are freely available on the internet. And then um, if there's enough people who don't have any way to watch a movie, like you don't have any of that stuff, then I will, um, one of the movies that I have on DVD, I'll do like a, I'll, I, I will pick and I'll do like a little viewing party after school for students to watch. If there's just, if you literally don't have access to any of those things, I, I I think it's unlikely that, that there will be anyone who has no access to any kind of movie. But anyway, uh, don't please don't go spend like $20 buying one of these movies. Uh, so uh, to give you, just to go over the movies real fast, uh, you have like The New World, Last of the Mohicans, The Patriot. Um, that's the Mel Gibson movie. Uh, spoilers, that one is not accurate. Uh, the 2004 version of The Alamo. But hey, if you want to watch the old John Wayne one from the 1960s, go for it. Uh, I'll say the 2004 one, um, 
a, uh, my department chair at Texas State University when I was uh, in grad school. He was the historical consultant on it, and he vouched for it uh, mostly being accurate. They, they did kind of go against his uh, wishes on a couple of things. But anyway, 12 Years a Slave, Lincoln, Gaines, New York, et cetera, et cetera. And you can kind of see that I just kind of picked movies that purport to tell true stories about history, about U.S. history for the most part. There's a couple that aren't specific to U.S. Um, I really wanted to stick to U.S. I added Torah, Torah, Torah. Um, well, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. I added Schindler's List. Schindler's List isn't really U.S. history. It's about the Holocaust, but it is something we study in here. So that's why I figured, yeah, that'll work. Uh, similarly, um, Defiance is about the Holocaust as well. Uh, and, and so, again, we don't study that. Uh, we, I mean, it's not U.S. history because it's about, like, Poland and during World War II. But we do learn about the Holocaust, so I figured that fits. All the others are specifically United States history um, other than those. So uh, anyway, I picked a whole bunch of stuff. And since I made this list, there's probably been like five more historical movies that have come out. And so if you think of one, you can get with me individually and I'll let you know. And then if I do, then I'll add it to the list and click the little notify people these things have changed thing. Um, the, uh, so that's the list of movies. So what you're doing is you are saying whether or not the movie is accurate or to what extent it is accurate. So back into the presentation and I'll, I'll show that. So how to write a thesis, your thesis statement should make, it has to do basically two things. It has to make a historically defensible argument. That is an argument that you can defend by using historical evidence. And it has to set up the structure for your argument. So I did one for a non-U.S. history movie that I love to just crap on, uh, Braveheart. The 1990, and so this is my thesis statement here in bold. The 1995 film Braveheart is a very historically inaccurate movie in its portrayal of the characters, events, and setting details of the turn of the 14th century Scottish rebellion. So can somebody tell me what I've done there in that, uh, aside from saying this movie is inaccurate, so I've made a statement which I can then now defend with, with, uh, with evidence. What else have I done with that thesis statement? I've given examples, and what are those examples going to be? Those are going to be my topic sentences. I just set up the five paragraph essay. You don't have to do the five paragraph essay. It is a really good rule of thumb, uh, but I set it up. I'm going to have a paragraph or a set of paragraphs about characters. I'm going to have a paragraph or a set of paragraphs about events, and I'll have a paragraph or a set of paragraphs about setting details. That's what I've done. And so what I've done is I basically, with this thesis sentence, I've told the readers what I'm going to argue and how I'm going to argue it. And that is the difference between a fine thesis statement and a good thesis statement. A fine thesis statement tells me what you're going to say. A good one tells me how you're going to say it. That is a that is true for any paper you write, really for any class, but especially for any history paper. That is an extremely important thing to do. Um, so outlining the structure. First paragraph is my introduction. Um, it should have one or two introductory sentences at the most, and then your thesis statement. I would I would say. I say at the, I say one or two at the most. Um, I would say a introduction longer than five sentences is not good. I think five sentences is honestly a little long. Um, a lot of students, and by a lot of students, I mean ninety-five percent of students, are like, "Man, I don't want to write this long paper. I'm going to make up a bunch of crap for my introduction, and it's going to look good." It does not look good. Anytime I see an introduction that's longer than about five, six lines, I'm like, oh, this person was just trying to BS me, is just trying to, you know, BS their way to the minimum length of the paper. So if you've got like a super long introduction and then your paper is like five pages long, then I'm like, okay, well, never mind. This person is just really verbose. But if your paper just barely, barely hits that minimum three pages and you have a long introduction, I'm taking off points because it's unnecessary. You're doing it to pad out your paper. So. You got a couple of sentences to hook me in. 
uh, and then you got your thesis statement. Maybe you have a little you know, sentence after your thesis statement, but you don't have to. Um, next, you got your body paragraphs. Each body paragraph has a topic sentence that's basically a mini thesis statement. That is extremely important, extremely important that you have topic sentences that clearly, clearly state exactly what that paragraph is going to be about. And I will demonstrate that on the next slide. And then you follow those by examples with evidence. Um, generally, uh, I like the kind of 3-3-3 three, three, three rule. You have three, par three body paragraphs. Each body paragraph has three pieces of evidence. Each piece of evidence has three sentences explaining it. That is not a concrete rule at all. It's just a good foundation. You could have one paragraph with five examples and another paragraph with only two. You could have one example that you talk about for like six sentences and another you only talk about for two. But that 3-3-3 three, three, three rule is a really good just, if you're just like, how, if I was a robot writing a paper, what would I do? It's three body paragraphs, three pieces of evidence, three uh, sentences explaining each one. Bam, bam, bam. And if you do that, by the way, if you had uh, a, bo uh, a body paragraph, you have a topic sentence, that's one sentence. Then you have three pieces of evidence, and then you have uh, each one which has three sentences, then that's 10 sentences per paragraph. 10 sentences per paragraph, three body paragraphs, plus a conclusion, an introduction conclusion, you have no, you would have no problem writing three pages if you do that. And so, yeah, then you have the conclusion, basically look at your introduction, follow that structure. Should not be long. Long conclusion is crap. You, it's, it's trying to make your paper look longer than it really should be, or than it really truly is. All right. So let's look at how to write a body paragraph. So here is a example body paragraph, uh, well, outline of a body paragraph from my thesis statement. So again, my thesis statement, break part is a very historically inaccurate movie news portrayal of characters, events, and setting details. So then topic sentence for one of my paragraphs, Braveheart is very historically inaccurate in its portrayal of characters. So right now I know this paragraph is all about characters and every piece of evidence I have is going to be using examples of characters to prove the movie is inaccurate. So then example number one, for instance, the film portrays the Scottish rebel hero, William Wallace, as a simple villager driven to rebellion by injustice. Now my evidence. In reality, William Wallace was the son of a small landowning nobleman, Sir Malcolm Wallace. And I have my uh, that little one there. I'm going to explain in a minute. Then I have my elaboration. William Wallace was of noble birth, but was made into a peasant in order to fit into the anti-establishment narrative of the film. I could continue and say, this proves the inaccuracy of the movie in that uh, at its very core, the movie is inaccurate because... The person is based on, the person whose nickname is Braveheart, is in fact a lie. Everything about him is a lie. And so I could kind of elaborate. Does that make sense? But that's how I would do that. And so I could, uh, so this is, uh, I would do that. Then I would say another example of a inaccurate character is the character of the Princess of England. And I would say the Princess of England is depicted as being in her early 20s and in an unhappy marriage, uh, leading to her sleeping with William Wallace near the end of the film, implying that her son is actually descended from Wallace and not from the king, period. In reality, not only did the, did the princess have a very loving marriage with the king, but in fact, she was three years old when William Wallace died, which is true. So that's a that's a pretty big one that his love interest in the movie uh, was three years old and living in France during the events of the movie. That's kind of a big deal. Um, and then I would also probably bring up that the movie very homophobically portrays the, uh, the crown prince of England as um, effeminately gay. Uh, because, well, honestly, because Mel Gibson is a bigot. Uh, in reality, there's no evidence of that at all. And there's actually stories about his love with the queen. But anyway, so um, note the citation. Oh, I forgot I put that little animated thing in there. Isn't that neat? Okay, more on that, more on a later slide about that. In fact, right here. 
in history classes, we usually use what is called the Chicago style as opposed to uh, the MLA style um, used in English, uh, the APA style used in most sciences, I think. But then there's another one like MPA, I think, is used for like medical sciences. And I, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, among other things, Chicago style is different in a number of ways. But one important way that it's different is in MLA, you do in-text citations like we've been doing with your essay practices, right? In Chicago, there is not in-text citation. There is no parenthetical citation in Chicago style. Chicago style uses either footnotes or endnotes. For this paper, we will use endnotes, but we will not do it 100% correctly. And I'm gonna, we're gonna do it my own special way that is specifically designed to make it easier on you. And I'm gonna explain that in a minute. So to insert an endnote, you simply, the easiest way to do it is you type a number at the end of the sentence or at the end of the use if you're using more than one source in a sentence. Uh, see below for that. And then you just make it a superscript. Now, this is not actually how to insert footnotes and endnotes in, um, in a paper. It's how we're going to do it. And to explain to you, for instance, if you were to my master's thesis has 128 citations. Now, I didn't have 128 sources. That's because in an actual history research paper, you will sometimes use the source multiple times. In an actual research paper, each of the, in an actual history paper, not this one, each of those sources gets its own number in the footnotes or endnotes. And so there's actually a button called insert footnote or insert endnote in most word processing programs, and it will add to the numbers. And so in a paper like this, if you use, say, each of your sources three times, well, then you'll end up with like 20 numbers, but we're not doing it that way. Instead, what we're going to do is you're going to have a bibliography. Each of your sources is going to be numbered. So say you've got nine sources in your paper. Each of your sources will be numbered one through nine in your bibliography. And then anytime you use source number three, you will do a three. Anytime you use source number six, you'll do a six. So it's different than the way you would actually do it in a, a quote unquote grown up research paper. And that is to make it easier on you. Okay. So the way you would do it is you just type the number and then you make it a superscript. You can do that by if you're in Google Docs. You just do control plus period. You just highlight the number and hold down control and then the plus button and then the period and it will superscript it. Or you can go up to format and go format and then go down font and then go down to that and superscript. But that's, you know, complicated. If you're in Microsoft Word, there's just a little button for it that looks like an exponent like that. So um, I'll show you real fast what it looks like in Word. All right, so I typey, 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 number two. So I highlight it. Oh, wait, y'all can't see me doing that. <laughs> okay, there you go. So, all right, so there's my, my beautiful sentence, and I highlight the two, and then right there, right up there is the superscript, and that's it. But if I was in... Google Docs, copy, 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 two. All right, so I can go format, text, superscript, and it does it, but I could also just control plus period and like that. Y'all can't see that I'm hitting control plus period, but that's what I'm doing. Either way works. Now, here's the problem. Uh-oh, <laughs> that's not good. At that point, if I do control and the little backslash, wait, no, that doesn't work. Come on. Oh, it's control minus. You're right. Nope. You're wrong. Control. 
Yeah, so, okay. Oh, okay. I just have to press it again. Control plus period again. All right, it's control plus period, and that changes it back and forth. Okay? So, there you go. We learned something new. All right. Anyway, back to our presentation. Uh, so, here's an example of what it looks like. One example of the anachronistic detail. So, this is for my third body paragraph on setting details. And so, one of my examples, I say one example of anachronistic details. Uh, anachronistic is does not fit into the history. Um, an, an example of an anachronism, uh, well, here is one, uh, is in the costume of the characters. Scottish Highlanders are depicted as painting their faces blue and wearing tartan kilts. However, blue face paint was actually not used by the Scottish, but rather the ancient Picts of Ireland, who eventually settled in Scotland. And the kilt was not introduced to Scotland until the late 16th century. These are both true, by the way. So... I, the, the deal about the Scottish, uh, not painting their face blue, um, that it was actually the picks that did it. I found that at source number one and the stuff about the kilt I found at source number two. And since I used both examples in a single sentence, I superscript it. I have my, I have my citation there. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Okay. Moving on. Those superscript numbers are not random. They'll correspond to numbered entries in your bibliography. Bibliography should look something like this. This is how we format in, uh, this is sort of how we format, I should say, in, um, in uh, Chicago style. Technically, this is the uh, format for endnotes, not for the bibliography, because, and this is complicated, and an actual, like, grown-up history paper, you have endnotes, and then you also have a bibliography by itself, because again, in the actual endnotes, you might be using the same source like 10 times, and it gets mentioned 10 times. See what I'm saying? But we're kind of combining endnotes and bibliography together for to make things easier for you. And for me. It'll be easier for me to, to grade, honestly. It'll also make your paper like four pages long instead of like 15. So there's that. Not that you would write it, you know, I mean, it's not like 15 pages of writing, you know, but it's why I always tell people like, oh, my master's thesis is a hundred and like uh, 58 pages long. And then you go and look at it and it's like, well, it's 114 pages long, but then there's like 30 pages of appendices, including like uh, five or six pages of bibliography and in notes. Well, there's actually not in notes, but there's footnotes instead, but anyway. Um, and as far as like, oh, well, how do I know this format? We'll come back to that. Uh, how did I do the fancy second line indent? Um, it's really easy and is the same in both Google Docs and Microsoft Word. You type out your citation, then click it. Uh, if it goes onto a second line, you click at the beginning of that second line on the ruler at the top. You slide the blue thing over to the half inch mark. Then you grab this little thing and slide it back to the margin. See how I demonstrated it in the pictures? Then hitting enter should auto format the rest of the paper to match, the rest of your bibliography to match. So to get it in Chicago, the first line is not indented. You have your number, space, and then you just type it. And then if you do that, then by default, this little where it says access da, 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 will be way over here. And then I just put my cursor there, drag that little thing over, drag it, and that will make the whole thing go over. Then I drag that and that'll make the top line go back. That makes sense. See, I'm glad I'm videoing this, not just uh, recording audio. Um, how do you do the citation? You can use my examples, but my examples, if you'll notice, are um, I have Wikipedia, which is a valid source. Um, I, I'm not old. Uh, old people don't like Wikipedia uh, because Wikipedia used to not be very accurate. Today, Wikipedia is highly accurate as long as it's nothing controversial. If you're looking up certain controversial topics, then it's not very accurate because there's people arguing over it all the time. But otherwise, it's good. So Wikipedia there. So I showed how to do a Wikipedia article. Then I have, uh, this is an article on the BBC's website. Then this is an article from a private website by a person. And then this is an article from uh, the uh, 
a textbook, not an article. This is a chapter from a textbook. So that's three different types of citations there I did for you. But you may find a citation that doesn't fit one of those, in which case your best bet is to go to citationmachine.net slash Chicago, and it will give you examples of basically every kind of citation you could think of. It'll also have a thing where you can type in your source and it will give you citation. The thing you need to note is we are using the footnotes and endnotes format, not the bibliography format, even though we're putting it on a page called bibliography, which I know is confusing, but it's for your own good, trust me. Um, the bibliography, so the thing is, is in, in a, again, grown up research paper, and when I say grown up, I mean like senior level of college research paper. You've got your footnotes or endnotes, right? Which are specific and say things like when you accessed it. And then because you already have that, your bibliography, so the bibliography version of Wikipedia would just say Wikipedia, doc, uh, Wikipedia the free encyclopedia. Um, and that's, and, uh, I would just say, basically it would stop right there where my pointer is. Well, that's not good enough. That's good enough if I also already have endnotes. I'm just having you do endnotes, so we're combining it. Okay, anyway. All right, important tips and tricks for writing any paper, not just for me, but for basically any professor. Um, they are, I wonder if I can, I'm gonna, sorry, y'all can't see what I'm doing, uh, but people at home can see that I, my face just shrunk a little bit. Um, all right, first of all, never, ever, ever, for the rest of your life, never write in first or second person unless you are writing a text message, an email, or a sometimes a work of fiction. But any work of nonfiction that actually counts for a grade of any sort, you never write in first or second person. That's no I, no me, no you, no we, none of that mess. It's all third person because we are the third person uh, removed objective observer of history. We are not someone talking about our own personal thoughts. You never say, I think, I believe, you know, you can see, none of that, ever. All right, number two, don't use passive voice, except it's fine if you do, just don't do it too much. Um, I put that there because there are some old school professors that think passive voice is the devil and will mark off your papers for it left and right. Honestly, I think that is a outdated uh, way of, of, of thinking and teaching. Um, sometimes passive voice is completely necessary. What is the difference? Active voice, the boy caught the ball. Passive voice, the ball was caught by the boy. It's always better to do active voice, except for when it's not better to do active voice. And that's all I can tell you. You, you will know. When you write it, if it, sounds, if it sounds weird in active voice, you might try passive voice. Don't be inconsistent with tenses. In a history paper, you speak in the past tense. Except in a book analysis, in which you talk in present tense about the book and past tense about the history, which is what we'll be doing in the spring. But for this paper, it's all in the past. So you write completely in the past. Don't have lots of quotes or long quotes or any quotes. In a paper this size, you should have somewhere between zero and three with zero being best. They should be no more than seven words long at the most and that's probably too long. In general, avoid quotes unless there's literally no good way to say it in your own words. For instance, if you're using characters use of slang or cursing as an example. Um, for instance, in Braveheart, there's a character that uses the F word a bunch of times. The F word didn't exist yet. So I could use that as an example of an anachronism and be like, so-and-so, the Irishman says the F word 15 times, but the F word did not exist. And then I could quote, I could potentially, instead of saying he says the F word, I could say he says F blah, 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 and if I wanted to. However, even there, did I really need to? Not really, I could just say he said it. I don't need to quote him. Uh, I think that a lot of times students use quotes to make their paper longer than it really is. But also I think a lot of the time you just use quotes because you're used to writing papers for English 
where you're analyzing people's um, uh, syntax, right? You're, you're, you're analyzing the way the author said something, in which case a quote is completely not just appropriate, but necessary, right? But for a history paper, a quote is rarely necessary. Sometimes it is, um, but rarely is it. Uh, it's a little different than like your textbook. Your textbook has quotes here and there to spice things up, but also your textbook is like 900 pages long. So, you know, how many quotes are there? If you go through, if you go through Give Me Liberty and you look for all the quotes, there's probably like way less than one quote per every three pages. And this is a three page paper. So there you go. My master's thesis, like I said, 114 words of actual writing, five quotes. So you can divide that and figure out how many quotes you should have per three pages, which would be about zero. And most importantly, and this is vital, vital, you always, always, always cite anything that is not 100% from your own brain. This is so important. You don't just cite quotes, you cite everything that you didn't make up. To go back to my example from a moment ago, I did not make up the fact that the Picts of Ireland settled in Scotland and painted their faces blue. I didn't make that up. That is a true fact that I found on, uh, well, actually see my numbers are off here, but I found it some, uh, somewhere. Um, so that's, that's a true fact. And the kilt, the whole thing about the kilt, I didn't make that up either. That is a true fact that I found in, on Wikipedia, right? So I actually found it other places too, but anyway, you get the idea. So because of that, I have to cite. All right, formatting, Times New Roman or Arial, either one is fine. 12 point font only, spacing, double spaced, no extra space before or after lines, okay? There's no like space in between paragraphs. Heading, just your name. We, that big old MLA heading that adds an extra like fourth of a page to your paper, will cost you points. You will lose points if you have that. We do not do that in history. In history, you put your name on the paper. That is all that goes on it. I don't need to know the date. The paper's due on December 2nd. Doesn't matter what date you put on it, it's due December 2nd. I don't need to know what period you're in. You're turning in a canvas, it sorts by period. I don't need to know that it's for Mr. Chandler. You better not turn in a paper that's for someone else, right? So why do we put any of those things? Do I need to know this is for US history? Did I forget what class I teach? I have no idea why MLA requires all that crap at the top of your paper, but we don't do that in history class. Uh, margins, one inch all the way around. Pages, three pages minimum, and that does not count your bibliography slash endnotes. That, by the way, is why we're doing endnotes instead of footnotes as well. Well, partly why. In the endnotes page, um, we're going to call it bibliography. You're going to type bibliography at the top of it, and then you're going to format it the way I formatted mine. Um, the reason we're typing bibliography at the top is actually twofold. One, because that's what you're actually supposed to do. But two, uh, it's because Turnitin will stop checking for plagiarism when it sees that word. Uh, now, do not think that that will, uh, don't, don't, uh, you try to like, you know, type the word bibliography, like a third of the way through your paper. It, that won't work that way, but it will see a page titled bibliography and be like, all right, I'm not going to check this page. Um, and that's good because otherwise everybody's turn it in would come up like 50% because of that. Well, actually 25%, but anyway, obviously if I see that number come up, I, I will then look at why is it doing that? Okay. The rubric for this paper. You will do an annotated bibliography turned in a week before this paper is due, about a week and a half. On Friday, November 22nd by 11.55 p.m., that is the Friday that we get out before Thanksgiving, you will turn in an annotated bibliography with five sources properly cited with at least three sentences each explaining what the source is about and how it'll be used in your paper. And you will also have a thesis statement at the top. <laughs> This will count as a double daily grade, so a double weighted daily grade, and also will be a, a, a count toward 20% of your grade on the paper. So if you 
do a bad job on that annotated bibliography and you get a 70, then I'm that's going to be 70 times 20% of your paper. So you need to do a good job on this. You also need to turn it in on time. However, I will not include late points in the actual paper, right? So if you turn in your annotated bibliography late and get a 70 on it, well, that is 100 for the calculation here, right? Turning the paper late and get a 50 on it, well, then that's what, uh, 80 times 20%? So you get the idea. All right, then 30% is for thesis and structure. Do you have a good thesis? Is your paper structured in a logical way and have clear topic sentences? 30% for content and sources. Is your paper the proper length? Does it fully argue its point? Does it have enough uh, examples? Does it have enough sources? Are they properly cited? Do you also have a bibliography? Note, your annotated bibliography is not the same thing as the bibliography at the end of your paper. It will look mostly the same, only it won't have, the one at the end of your paper won't have all these explanations, and you'll probably have extra sources too, but who knows. 15% for grammar, spelling, and style. Does your paper have proper grammar spelling? Did you follow my tips and tricks for writing any paper? And 5% formatting and directions. Did you follow the directions? Is your prop paper properly formatted? How to turn it in? Two things. You must share it with me on Google Drive with permission to edit, and you must submit it to Canvas so that it can go through turning it in. It will not be considered turned in on time unless you've done both of those things on time. 